Throughout the history of chess, there has been one undisputed greatest female chess player ever, and her name is Judith Polgar. Judith was ranked the number one woman in the world for 25 years, from 1989 until 2014, and she comes from a chess family. Her father, Laszlo, also trained her sister, Susan, who went on to become the women's world champion and a very strong grandmaster, and their sister, Sophia, who I believe is an international master and went on to pursue another career. In this video, I am going to show you 11 of Judith's victories against current or former world champions in her career. Timestamps are on the video player as always, and at the end, I am going to spend a few minutes talking about women in chess and why I decided to make this video. So here we go. We're gonna go chronologically in Judith Polgar's career. This is 1991, so she's about 14, 15 years old, and she became a grandmaster at 15 years and five months, breaking Bobby Fischer's record for youngest ever. Her opponent is Grandmaster Alexander Khalifman, who was world champion from 1999 uh, to 2000 for about a year, uh, when there was this whole split with Gary, Fide, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, technically he's not world champion yet, so current, former, and future. So we have a French defense, and Judith has a very attacking style, always looking for imbalances and combinations. Uh, Khalifman plays this bishop crawl variation at, known as the Fort Knox, and in many of these lines, Black will trade this bishop, and you'll see that happening in a few moves right now. And what Black will do uh, is usually set up something like this, just a very solid structure, getting rid of the light squared bishop so it's not stuck behind everybody. And it's known that white has some slight advantage here because of the bishop pair and the space advantage, but black is completely fine. But Khalifman decides to play instead of c6, c5, and that's also very logical. Uh, it looks like he's giving away his b7 pawn, but he's certainly not. Uh, and if you take on c5, believe it or not, knight c5 is... Uh, it looks logical to hit the bishop, but that allows bishop to b5 check, and that's very unpleasant. So, uh, instead of that, he castles, and this pawn's not going anywhere, and neither is this pawn, and if you take on b7 with the queen, I'll get counterplay on the b-file. So, queen takes b7, leads to rook b8 and knight c5, and both of those things are just unpleasant for white. Um, so, we have b4, and Judah decides to try to hang on to the pawn. Black tries to undermine. She takes. Takes. Now she castles, and we have the following position. So, here white is a pawn up, and that's exactly what Judith was going for. Now the problem for white is, of course, the pawns are doubled on the A-file, so they're kind of all the way out over there. Uh, but the pawn on D3 uh, is very well protected, and let's not forget that the B7 pawn still main r remains very weak. And if white plays rook B1, it will be able to win it very quickly. Uh, so Khalifman here plays the move queen D7, protecting the pawn, rook B1 played, knight D5. And here... Uh, now that the queen has been disconnected from the pawn, Judah comes up with a very, very interesting idea, which totally, this is just, this is pure Judith, and this is crazy because she's 14, 15 years old at the time that this game happens, but she's already got the style that she would have for the rest of her career. So, she plays a, fa a fascinating move. She plays the move a4, which just looks like a blunder of a pawn because the opponent can play queen takes pawn. It's not really because, of course, after queen a4, you would relinquish defensive b7. Uh... Her other idea here was like, if black just brought the rook, she actually wants to play rook b5. Cutting the circulation of the queen, defending her pawn, targeting the knight, and, and, and trying to double up and go get an extra layer of attack on b7. It's a very flexible move. Uh, and her opponent bites. He takes the pawn. She takes on b7, and he goes bishop to d8, removing the bishop from the side of the rook and going for this. And this one seemingly obvious move to target that pawn, which cannot be protected, is the downfall. It's actually the downfall for black's position, which now gets virtually n like un undefendable. Indef indefensible? I, I, I make chess videos. I'm not very good with my English. Um, knight to h5. And now her intentions are very clear. She wants to go and attack the king. He takes on a5, and of course, here white can play a move like queen g3, threatening mate, but black will go here. So she changes it up. She plays the dynamite strike, bishop h6, and you can't even take it because then the king is open and that's mate. So Khalifman, after bishop h6, plays bishop c3, defending that pawn, and now she plays queen g3, and black cannot defend the position. Black cannot move the F pawn because that would disconnect the bishop from the defense. If F5, you actually open up white's rook. So she had this whole thing planned. And now he has to go here. And she picks up the exchange. And you'll see this happening throughout this video. How she launches a devastating attack. 
and transitions that into an endgame or just a winning position. And she ends up forcing the rooks and the queens off, gets a four on four in terms of pawns, and has a rook versus bishop. And this was a long game, so I'm going to kind of hit the forward button and show you how she wins it um, after she trades the two major pieces, which are the rooks and the queens. She brings her king. You see what she's doing with her king? She slow crawls the king notice, doesn't rush with the pawn trade, keeps pawns on the board, and creates a nice structure. She gets the knights off. You'll notice that she plants the rook on a very annoying square. This is cutting off the king, and it's defended by that pawn. Black has no activity now, and she makes this nice, solid structure. Uh, a few moves later, she breaks with the d-pawn. Takes, takes, and it was in this position. Khalifman resigned. Uh, because this is, a this is an endgame that will take some effort to win, but, uh, but, but, but it's, it's, it's winning for white. This is a very tough structure to break, um, and, uh, white will go on to win this game. So that's win number one. Let's go to win number two. This is a game that Judith played against the legendary Boris Spassky. Uh, if you don't know who Boris Spassky is, then you need to watch this video until it concludes. Uh, and then immediately go to Google or your nearest search engine and type in Boris Spassky and learn about who this incredible man was. Um, th this was a match that they played in 1993, uh, an organized match, and there was many Rui Lopez's. And I believe this was a rapid match, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but I could be I could be wrong, but let me double check. Uh, it, it No, I, I think it's just straight up a match, a, cl a classical chess match. So Bishop A4, Knight, a knight F6. Castles, Bishop E7. This is all a mainline Rui. Uh, everything's been played, and the first move that really comes to mind is, is this move, and the first move that should be analyzed, Knight to B8. Uh, <clears throat> knight to B8 is known as the Briar system, and the point is that Black brings the Knight back and then routes it over here and then develops the Bishop like this. And you say, well, why didn't Black just do this in the first place? I mean, why did Black play Knight C6 on the first move and uh, then bring the Knight back? Well, that's just, that, that's just chess. Uh, the Rui Lopez is a closed system, especially this one, and it allows a lot of maneuvering. Like, there's some lines where black goes knight to a5 um, and tries to play the move c5, like this. That is also a thing. Um, but the Briar system decides to put the knight on d7 and put the bishop like this. Uh, Judah plays bishop to c2 and knight f1, and she reroutes her knight to g3. Uh, white has a nice space advantage in this system, uh, but black is incredibly solid. Uh, and oftentimes we'll actually put the fianchettos on both sides and really await something that's going to happen. Uh, as the players maneuver more, Judith closes the center, plays bishop g5, gets booted, but this is now becoming a target because the pawn can't go backwards while the bishop can, uh, and takes more central space. Spassky begins mobilizing on the queen side. But Judith, however, plays queen d2, attacking that pawn on h6, and then this move. And this is, a uh, the point of this move is to reroute the knight to g4 from where you will trade and open up the h-file. And uh, Spassky decides to plug that with the move queen h4. The problem is that once the queen goes there, it will get completely shut off from the rest of the position with the move g5. Uh, if you take on g5, I have bishop g5. I mean, your queen literally does not have breathing room right now. Like, I will play bishop d1 and it's trapped, forcing black to play this move bishop h6 counter pin um still a very dangerous position for black uh and spassky plays c5 now c c5 is incredibly committal because it completely locks everything forever judah plays knight f1 the point of knight f1 is again to just make this queen feel very uncomfortable uh it proceeds to hang around on h3 um but here judith finds a really really nice idea uh i mean i would offer to pause the video here and try to let you all find it um, but, uh, I'm going to proceed. You are more than welcome to pause. She activates one of her pieces by not moving it at all. Huh? Solve that riddle. She activates this rook by not moving it. F3. Taking away the final square on this diagonal and threatening to activate it with rook e2, rook h2, and targeting over here. Black simply does not have time to evacuate the queen. If black plays a move like knight b8, I still play rook e2. And for example, if you evacuate the queen, let's not forget that when you moved your knight, it stopped guarding f6. So now I take my queen and my bishop once again open up over here and you have all the same problems. 
So after the move f3, Spassky decided to call the bluff and take on g5 and say, well, I'm up a pawn, I'll escape with my queen. After rook e2, knight f6, however, um, g4, look at this move, giving away the f3 pawn. But knight h2, queen h3, rook f1, knight g4. Black is about to be up three, well, black is up three pawns. I, I suppose after rook f1, black was about to be up three pawns. Um... Now, Judith could have, uh, instead of playing like this, played bishop takes g5 and just won the pawn back right away. And after this, rook h2 wins the queen. That's another idea. She decided to do this in flashy style, which was giving away three pawns to infiltrate with the rook. Black plays bishop to g7. She takes, takes, plays rook g2. And here, black can play this move queen to c8 and protect the bishop. And say, haha, I am up three pawns. But that would lead to the devastating demolition of these four pieces with bishop takes g5. And after hg5, there is no way to protect yourself against the incoming triple power attack over here with the queens. And there's just nothing you can do. Uh, so for that reason, Spassky continued to hang around with his queen and sacrifice his bishop. The problem is, the devastating attack is still being delivered uh, and it's got expedited shipping coming in one to two business days. In this case, one or two moves. Uh, Queen h6. And believe it or not, once again, we have a transition from attack to, to winning endgame. Queen h6, king h6. And the simple rook h2 check. Removing the defender of the bishop. Judith Polgar is up a bishop here. And Boris Spassky played one more move and just simply resigned because that bishop is going to prove decisive. So uh, even in a closed position, a very maneuvering game... All Judith needs is a couple of moves to get going. The first of which closes the center, cutting off black circulation, inducing a pawn weakness, and then immediately going to target it. A nice little knight reroute to open up the H file, and the rest is history. So that's her second win, and this one is against Boris Pasky, whom she played multiple times in a match and defeated him multiple times, and he defeated her, but this was just a very nice win. Her third win that I'm showing you is against Smyslov. Now, Vasily Smyslov was one of also the strongest uh, players in the Soviet Union. You absolutely must know who he is. Uh, and this is from 1995. It's, uh, it's actually a match called Veterans vs. Women. Uh, and it happened multiple times, actually. They played each other multiple times. And this time, Judah has the black pieces. And with the black pieces, A, it was Sicilian. It was, uh, it was King's Indian defense. I mean, she came to fight. And she plays a really interesting variation. This is known as Quinteros. And nowadays, it's, very, it's, it's just very rarely seen. The point is to combat the open Sicilian with the queen on c7. And for example, knight takes d4, there are some variations where you play like, for example, a6 to stop knight b5, and you have the benefit of not moving any of your center pawns. So you can play like more aggressively in the center, and the queen targets the diagonal, the c-file, etc. But it's just the sideline, and white plays the most principled way, which is c3 to try to take the center with the pawn and take back with the pawn. Now, the players actually don't trade anything for a while. They actually go about 10 moves and get a very locked central structure. In fact, the structure almost resembles an e4, e5 position. Just very different piece placement and not a Rui Lopez like we saw in the last game. Uh, Smyslov chooses to open up the center and clarify the situation with DEDE. -E -D -E. The players bring their rooks to the middle. He pins the knight to the rook. She moves the rook out of the way. Knight f1, rook d8, and... Uh, Smyslov takes on f6. You'll notice this knight reroute fights for the d5 square because white wants to take on f6, removing all control of d5 and put the knight there. So she moves the knight back to e7, opening up her bishop and fighting for this again. Takes, takes, and bishop c4. Everything is going to revolve around the d5 square. You'll notice that Smyslov is trying to win it completely. Here, Judith plays takes, 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 and queen c6. So now the rooks are off the board. The position is completely equal. Um, but... Judith does not need, I thought I just saw a spider, uh, <laughs> Judith does not need uh, any excuse to just completely explode the board. And here, it's kind of difficult for white to defend the spawn. If white plays a move like knight d2, it does the job, but now black can take over the initiative and try to fight for something. Uh, Smyslov goes for the f7 pawn, and that looks pretty dangerous. I mean, that looks like you're giving away a center pawn, but getting closer to the king. But like I said, Judith doesn't need a second invitation to the party. She will show up. Queen takes e4. Go ahead and take my pawn. I'm safe. I'm safe. Now the queen goes to b1 check. The knight comes back to block, and one move completely shatters the hopes and dreams of white's position. 
e4. And if you're wondering, what, how does that do anything? Just knight to d2, everything is protected. I'm going to kick your queen out. No, 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 no. My queen is here to stay. The queen hits this. The queen continues to pin the knight to the king. This is under pressure. And there is one thing lurking in this position. It's the fact that black plays bishop to e8, trying to get queen f7. But let's say black doesn't do that. Let's say black plays a move like a3. It's very difficult to protect f2. In fact, it's almost impossible. If you play the move g3 here, I completely disregard this and shatter everything. Opening up my bishop, this bishop, this queen, everyone's fighting. Right? So, Smyslov goes for bishop to e8, trying to get queen f7 on the board. Jude, it's like, ah, 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 get out of here. Queen a4, bishop h4, swarms in with her queen and bishops. And folks, what did I just show you? g3, e3, dynamite, counterpunch, nothing you can do. If you take this, it's made in one by virtue of crisscross applesauce with the bishop. And uh, if you take on e3, it's not me coming forward that kills you, although that will. It's actually just, I played all these forward moves to come back. Nobody can prevent bishop takes e3. If white moves king h2 to get out of the pin, that's very nice that you unpinned yourself because now you get mated in one move and there's just nothing else. The queen cannot protect the pawn. It just gets taken. The knight cannot protect the pawn either because I mate you with my bishop. So, from a totally seemingly harmless position, I mean, Judith Polgar just says, hello, and explodes. Bishop h4, I mean, queen b1, queen e1, bishop h4, bam, 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 bishop g5, and Smyslov resigned. Her fourth victory comes against Anatoly Karpov, the man who had a decades-long rivalry with Garry Kasparov, uh, world champion uh, in some some people's favorite player of all time, frankly. Um, you'll find a lot of people who, who I think, find Karpov very, very respectable and uh, my, in, in their mind might be like the, the, the sleeper goat uh, and really like his playing style. Now, Polgar uh, defeated him multiple times. They played many, many games each, against each other. This is not like her first win ever against them or anything. But it's one of the nicest, and it's one of the ways she did what Karpov did to people, but she did it to Karpov. Uh, it's 1998, we're in Munich. Um, or wait, no, 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 no. I don't think we're... No, no, this was not in Munich. No, no, I think this was actually in Budapest, in uh, in Hungary. Um, and uh, Karpov plays the Karo Khan defense. Now we have the Karpovian variation, literally. It's known as the Karpov line, which is knight d7 to try to go knight f6. Uh, Judith plays this line where there is a trap after h6, knight e6, takes bishop g6's mate. That is not how she defeated Mr. Karpov. Instead, we got a, we got a position where Judith had a nice space advantage, as, as always, and, you know, stops castles with queen h7 mate. Um, and Karpov actually plays this king f8 variation, where black sacrifices the right to castle, but has baited white with the queen to kind of stand around here and potentially be a target. Now, listen, in pure Judith style, she castles queenside, and uh, invites this sm s small damaging of a pawn structure, giving her an isolated pawn, but counterbalancing that with the active rook, and that's exactly what she does. Moves the king to b1 to stabilize, stabilize all the queenside pawns, and actually uses that broken structure against her opponent to play e4, and try to play e5, which she does sometime later. Plays the move c3, so this is never a problem. The c2 pawn can always be out of danger. Karpov plays knight d7, bishop c2. We have a trade of knights in the center of the board. And queen f2, and queen takes a7. She basically calls Karpov's bluff. Like, dude, you're going to give me the pawn? That's completely fine. I will wander over there, and I will take it. You can have this, but now a very nice idea. Very, very nice idea. e5. This is known as a clearance sacrifice. You basically just completely give your opponent a pawn, right? But in doing so, you've opened up your bishop, and now get a really powerful initiative. Rook to e1 kicks the queen away, and immediately gets the pawn back. She then plays like this and forces Karpov's king out to g6. Uh, she comes back to d4. Now, she had a way to execute this a little bit better um, by playing queen to e3. I believe this is the way to win this game, to try to go rook e7. But this is also a rapid game, so time is probably ticking uh, and is getting lower. If black plays something like rook e8 here, looking for the trade of rooks, you have this. And the king can't escape. The king just can't escape because it gets destroyed on the diagonals. Uh, instead of that, Judith plays it like this, but that allows the king to kind of hide and just briefly hang around. Whereas, again, in this position, uh, if she had played queen f5, there, there was like a, a way she could have done this a little bit cleaner. Um, but uh, she ends up bringing the pieces back, and black is absolutely paralyzed, although still kind of okay in this endgame. Still kind of okay in this endgame. 
Queen c4 threatens mate, and uh, Judith continued to kind of improve her position basically with no effort. I mean, black has no moves. As much as the computer wants to tell you 0, 0, 0, black really has no moves. All the practical chances are still with white, and uh, it, it's a rapid game, so obviously play is some, sometimes a little bit diminished, but now Judith takes it to the 3 on 1 endgame over here. Uh, and, uh, rook takes c5, queen d8 check, and Carpo played queen f8, <laughs> and bishop h7 <laughs> is the, uh, is the, is the knockout punch. King h7, queen f8. Not, not very often you get to see Karpov with, uh, with a queen blunder in one move. Uh, and by the way, this, this is not a mouse slip, if anyone's wondering. This is, uh, 1998. There was no sent, there's no such thing as mouse slips in night. This is a human mouse slip, over the board mouse slip. Queen e8 here would have uh, maintained uh, some sort of holding, and it might not be the cleanest victory, but, I mean, Judah just launched such a belligerent attack on Karpov in this game, even against his beloved Karakhan, the line that the uh, the whole thing is named after, so I did want to feature it. Um, and uh, listen, a win's a win. It has, the, it has the ups and downs of a chess game, so let's go to game number five. Judith also defeated Vichy Anand. Now, they also played many, many games against each other, and it was difficult to pick my favorite. Uh, but this is from 1999 in Dos Hermanas. Uh, it's a very, very famous setting for chess tournaments, um, and it's, a, it's an open Sicilian. It's a knight orf with bishop 2e3. And this was like when the Knight Orf was just getting its getting its feet under it, right? With G4, so these E6 lines with G4, uh, and Judith does not need a, a second invitation to play G4, G5 ideas. Like I said, uh, E5 attacks the Knight and also attacks the pawn here. Knight F5, G6, and G5. And basically, after G takes F5, rather than taking here and getting the Knight back, she takes here and has sacrificed the piece. So. You've sacrificed the piece on move nine. And you're gonna see this variation, I think, later on in this video. And th th this is like, this is what it used to be like. It used to be like the wild, wild west before all these computers. It's a crazy line. I mean, if you take back on f5, for example, I'm gonna take this, put my knight on d5, and just be completely winning. So black plays d5 to take control of the center and sacrifice back the piece, and white just does not take it. White plays queen f3 and long castle. You cannot take either of my pieces because you would lose your queen. Black plays knight d7, and Judith on move 1314 is now down two pieces. She's down two pieces, down two knights. Two knights. But she's got the pawns targeting this. Open file, targeting the pawn. Bishop c4 on the way to target this. All of black's pieces are on the back rank. Bishop to g7, rook to g1, anticipating short castle. And Anand just goes, I'm going to give you back the knight and castle into the hurricane. Queen to e3, king h8. Here comes another pawn. Queen moves out of the way to b6. Do you trade queens when you're trying to attack? No! Queen h6, in comes the... Whoa! But you can't take that. <laughs> it's not really a rook sacrifice, but queen g7. Forcing black to play this ugly, ugly move, completely disallowing a dark toward bishop from moving. And now, you saw the same idea a couple of games ago. Was it against Smyslov? Backwards bishop move. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. e4 to disallow the f-pawn from moving, but now bishop c4... And bishop e6. I mean, it seems like everything she did in this game was belligerently attacking Anand. It's like Anand, like, stole a puppy or something. Rook a7, rook c6, a5, bishop e3. Targets the rook. Rook moves out of the way. Bishop comes back to, t to target this and threaten this. Anand's got to play rook to b8. Now rook up just one square. So this can't move. This can't move because of the target on the c-file. Uh, sorry, on the c-file. <laughs> on the, on the, G the g7 bishop. B4? And she says, uh, uh, no attack for you. No, I'm good. Rook B5, now Bishop C6. Anand takes on F5, and rather than taking the Knight on D7, we have Rook C8, Rook C8, Bishop D7, forking the Rooks. One of the Rooks is now taken. And actually, for a brief moment, material is completely equal. But the position is plus 6 for white, after just the very calm Rook D1. And Vichy never got to move this g7 bishop or this queen ever again. He got to move the king. He moved it one more time. And now she played the very calm queen g2. There is no way to protect e4, which ultimately would lead to no way to protect the king. And it was in this position that Vichy Anand resigned. Now, Vichy is one of the strongest players of all time. And the two of them did go back and forth. I, he had the better record. Um, 
but man, I mean, what a what a game. I mean, Anand's no joke. Like, let's be let's just be very clear. For many people, he's top five player of all time, top ten player of all time. And look what Judah did. I mean, she sacrificed two knights by move fourteen and was just her foot was on the gas the entire time. That's not how actually you should drive a car, but. What an awesome game, and let's go to game number six. Well, this is the big one, folks. Gary Kasparov in 2002, world champ, although obviously defeated by Kramnik in 2000. Uh, in 2000. Uh, but it's kind of funny because Kasparov plays a Berlin, actually. The, the, and this is a rapid uh, event known as Russia versus the rest of the world. Um... Uh, this is a mainline Berlin defense, and back in the day, this is actually exactly what it, it was Kramnik who uh, made his opponent self-destruct when he played this. So Kasparov takes something from Kramnik and actually uses it. And I think that Judah did this because it was a very low-risk approach, and, and Kasparov was always the guy pushing the issue. He wasn't the guy implementing an opening like the Berlin. And so I think she actually chose this because she had a feeling that Gary would do things in a position where he doesn't have to. This was a psychological decision. So knight d4, bishop h7, g4. And Gary uh, actually goes for h5. So Gar Gary's the one trying to make something happen, right? With move h5. She plays knight f5. This is She really likes this knight on f5. Inviting this trade when white would have a dominant central space advantage, bring the king to the center, rook g1, rook d1, every, uh, rook d1, everything is going well for white. She plays the knight to f5, Gary plays bishop f8 protecting his pawn, and she just brings the king, and slowly improves her position, the rook gets booted out, rook back to h7, so instead of going to f3, she goes to g3, and maybe wants to play f4. f6 targets the pawn in the center of the board, and here Judah plays bishop f4. But you'll notice everything Gary's doing is, is, is trying to play for something. From a position in the Berlin where you really don't need to do much at all. I mean, you can play bishop to e6. You can play b6. I mean, you can, you can just vibe, for lack of a better word. Um, Gary plays knight to h4, getting a trade. Then he, then he targets the pawn and tries to create this break with h5. And brings in the rook. And it br breaks again. But... He doesn't have to do any of these things, and, and, and if anything, it, it allowed Judith to just get a very powerful central presence, and now you've got a position where the rooks are super powerful, Gary's walked himself into a pin, and after takes, takes, rook e6, Gary's just going to be losing this pawn. Now Gary's got to defend a rook endgame. He plays rook to h8, creating counterplay, but she just takes and plays rook d5. She's going for the second pawn. Gary gives a couple of checks, and the king runs away to the middle, he plays b6, centralizing, uh, sorry, stabilizing c5, but now rook c6 check, king goes to the b-file, and she plays rook d7. And now the rooks are doing a little bit of, of crisscross applesauce, g7 is under target, f-pawn will become a pass pawn. She defends the, she defends the f2-pawn, and doubles up. You got the pigs on the 7th rank is what that's called. Rook f5, rook b7 check. Forcing the king to make a difficult decision. If you go here, I take with check, which is very bad. Gary plays king c8. She gives one more check and takes this pawn. And now she's threatening a mate from both sides and threatening to win another pawn. And even though she just has an extra pawn, Gary Kasparov resigns. Because she's about to win a second pawn, consistently threaten mate, and just win this rook endgame. And apparently after Gary lost this game, he like stormed out. Uh, he, you know, he was like, I'm not talking to anybody. Uh, the two of them had a bit of a, a little bit of a, he a heated, you know, rivalry strong because Gary did have a very dominant record. Actually, I think the next game or the, the game we're going to look at where she played against uh, Kramnik later on in the video, it, it was a pretty lopsided rivalry or at least head-to-head -head score, but this was the first time that she beat Gary Kasparov and it was a big moment in her career. So not everybody gets to beat Gary when he's like number one in the world for 20 years. So... On to game number seven. 2002 was a pretty big year for Judith Bolgar because she also defeated Ruslan Ponomaryov, who's one of the strongest grandmasters, period, uh, and uh, world champion in his own right. This was played in Indonesia, in Bali, and it was a uh, Nidorf, and she actually played the Nidorf with black. You'll see, you've seen the Nidorf multiple times in this video. Uh, Knight g4 is an invitation in the Nidorf to actually repeat moves. Some games have ended like this, but black... Uh, is faced with bishop g5 here. She just, again, kicks out the bishop and plays bishop g7. We already have a position of massive imbalance, and Ponomaryov decides to attack 
with the move e5. Now we're going to have some fun in this game. She takes, the bishop takes, castles, and Ponomaryov is coming with the h-pawn. She closes down the h-file with the move g4. He plays g3 to get the bishop out to g2, and then he castles queenside. Opposite side castling, you know we're about to have some fun. Bishop e6 comes out, that targets the queenside. Bishop g2 comes out. Rook d8, rook e1. h5 makes sure that nothing is going to happen on the king side. White plays b3, which actually looks kind of silly, like why would you destabilize your knight, but it's a very good move. She plays rook c8 to unpin and potentially hurl the c-pawn forward. He plays knight to a4, we have a trade of rooks, and the queen moves out of the way. Now, if you were to take my queen, of course black would take like this and open up the c-file. So bishop f1 reinforces the queen, and here Judith finds a very nice move. Bishop c4. A move that looks impossible. If bc4, I take the knight. And if queen to c4, which is what's played in the game, you lose this bishop. Now we have bishops of opposite color, so they don't see each other at all, which means we have tremendous imbalance in this game. c3 looks to shut down this diagonal, so she goes to this diagonal instead and targets this. Queen c5, queen f3, the queen continues to hang around. Bishop d3 lines up the bishop to black's king side. Black attacks with bishop h6 check. The king moves. And now the knight jumps into the center of the board, and this is very tricky. It's very tricky because if you take on e4, then you're mated in three. It's just mate in three, the king's gotta go, and then I mate you. That's not tricky. But if you take on h5, which is a free pawn, I go here, hit your rook, hit your bishop, hit your pawn. This is incredibly dangerous. The only way to protect everything is to sacrifice the rook. Instead of that, Ponomaryov plays this move, but after knight takes f2, queen g2... He's now down a pawn, and the knight is threatening to come back, after which both of your pawns will be lost. Ponomaryov plays rook to e1, stabilizing things, and immediately she notices that the d-file is open, and it's free real estate. And the rook jumps into d2, the queen comes back to d5, and even though a check is possible, the king is just safe on g7, and this position shows that opposite color bishops really benefit the attacking player. Because this bishop is a killer, and the way she wins this is by very easily clear and sacrificing the rook. Queen comes in, and it's not taking this, because then you would lose this. It's again a backwards quiet move. She comes back with the knight to attack the queen. The king is safe. No one can guard the rook. And in this position, Ponomaryov resigned a brutal sicilian defense fight with opposite side castling punch you know with 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 a couple of exclamation point moves from judith polgar at the right moments and she wins a very nice game now for the eighth game we are looking at 2005 in san luis in argentina i believe the world championship tournament so the world championship used to be the term well there was many formats but there was a tournament and Judith played against Rustam Kazimjanov, who is just incredibly strong. Uh, and it, what, it, one of the most accomplished players ever, and still continues to work with the top GMs. He's famously on the team of Fabiano Caruana. In fact, he might just be, like, his right-hand man. Uh, and this is a, uh, a, a something we've seen before, actually. You will notice that the variation looks incredibly familiar with Knight f5. Uh, you'll notice that, in fact... A lot of this looks quite similar, but it takes a, a, a slightly different approach here because rather than bishop d2, oh, that's not how that game went, not this, which we saw against Anand, but actually Judith just goes bishop takes d4. So she still sacrifices a piece, but she sacrifices her bishop in this game rather than sacrificing the second knight. But I, I mean, still, it's quite crazy you can be down two pieces on move 14 and still have a very interesting position now of course this this knight will be sacrificed a uh, black really should not be doing this uh this is in its purest form uh, an example of the fact that development and activity in central space is more important than material black is dead lost here if you play something like this rookie four wins your queen very very bad position so black does essentially what black did in the game that anand played but rather than castling which would be devastating because in this version, there is a rook out. So by sacrificing the bishop, she's brought her rook out, and the idea is to rotate it over. And yes, this is all that she prepared, 100%. So instead of that, Kazimjanov is forced to play this move king f8 uh, and try to trade queens. Now, obviously, white does not want a queen trade. White could trade queens, take on f6, and be a piece down with some initiative. She chooses not to trade, and instead just team the queen up with the rook and go to the back rank. After knight 2e8... 
Um, she plays a move which, again, just looks impossible. I don't know if this is still her prep. If this was in her prep, 20 moves down the line, incredibly impressive. But I think this is kind of inspiration over the board. Look at this move. I mean, are you kidding me? Now, this is a common idea in some Sicilians to literally just give the bishop away to play rookie one or in some lines sacrifice on b5. In this case, uh, taking on b5 is just too slow. This is an idiotic move because black now is the one attacking. Whereas uh, if you play rookie one, rook a2 is not possible because of course the knight never left. So rookie one uh, and here Kazimjanov can sacrifice the queen. In fact, he probably has to sacrifice the queen uh, but she would have taken on e8, or I don't know if she would have. Um, and this position, it looks like black has sufficient pieces. Black has two rooks and a bishop for a queen. But because white has such a lead in development, black just cannot defend against all the threats. Like, black will get blown off the board here by queen, by by, by knight. That's that's it. I mean, so instead, Kazimjana plays b4 to create a little counterplay. She plays knight out to b5. What's funny about knight out to b5 is that the computer thinks the position is holdable after bishop to e5 to try to go king g7. So knight b5, we're gonna, we're gonna just uh, calmly forget about. It would have been much better to play rook takes e7 straight up and just take the queen. The point is that after this, there is the absolutely brutal knight a4. And if you were to take, I would take on c8. But also knight b5 straight away. Um... I, I'll, 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 I'll never know why she didn't decide to take the queen, but it scared her opponent so much that he sacrificed the bishop with check and just believed the, 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 the move knight b5. So, uh, and as many times as we can throughout this video, we're going to see transitions from attacking positions to endgames. And now she is a pawn up in an endgame where black's pieces are completely paralyzed. So she enters the second phase of the game, which is controlling the opponent getting a trade of pieces, but uh, this is simply an endgame where white is playing very effortlessly for a victory, being two pawns up. And she ends up winning it by advancing the c-pawn, coordinating with the knight, pushing the pawn all the way, and after king c5, it was because I'm John of resigning, because the bishop cannot stay patrolling the promotion square, and so after king c5, she won the game. Um, listen... I gotta feature positions she's down two pieces on move 14 and sacrifices a third one further down the line. I mean, Judith, this was just pure, unfiltered, unadulterated violence. And uh, she delivered it. Now, game number nine. Obviously, we're pretty far into the video. So if you didn't lose your attention span and you're still here, uh, thank you and you're amazing. I and all the people who clicked out won't be given that compliment. But this game, I'm the, mo I, I'm, I'm, I'm the most uneasy about including. Now, Vladimir Kramnik, according to statistics, had far and away the best record against Judith Polgar. I don't know. He was like her kryptonite. Uh, and this is, I think, the only game I could find that she defeated him. And it was a blitz game. It's the only video. Uh, it's the only game in this video that's a blitz game. Now, granted, it was from the World Blitz Championships, Moscow, Russia, 2009. So can't really complain about that. Uh, but the Wikipedia page said that all her wins versus world champions were rapid and classical, not Blitz. And Blitz inherently loses a little bit of its uh, allure or status because, you know, you can show up drunk to a game and nobody will really care. Um, and it's just a little bit more lackadaisical. But it's a win nonetheless. It's the one I'm the most hesitant about including, but it's a win against the world champion and arguably top five player of all time. So shush. All right. I don't think that if we're rated like, you know, 800, we're allowed to we're allowed to gatekeep what world champions you can and, and can't include in a video. Anyway, uh, and I'm, I'm including myself, I'm 800. So Judith plays a uh, very principal chess against the Scandinavian, immediately going after Kramnik's f7 pawn. He decides to castle, castles knight c6, and she's trying to hunt him down. Now, the problem with playing the way that she does this, which is just belligerently headfirst sacrificing on f7, is the fact that black is actually completely fine. Even though white has two pawns, black is fine. Uh, but it's blitz. And this is what you do in blitz. So the, the quality of the play in inherently goes down. And Kramnik plays this very nice counter-aggressive shot. Focusing on this bishop on c7. She takes, takes, takes. And I mean, Kramnik's just got a, Kramnik's just got a good position here. He's got very powerful bishops. The knight is threatening to come in. The queen is going to join the party. This is very, this is very tough for white. 
Queen e2 targets the bishop. The bishop moves out of the way. She brings a rook to the center. She moves the queen out of the way of the attack of the knight. And knight comes to d4, targeting the bishop on e6. Now she has to stabilize and try to block things off. Knight to e6. King h1 moves out of the way. And here, Kramnik, after a series of very, very decent moves, plays a pretty absurd move. He, he gets greedy and he takes this pawn on a2. <laughs> That's a kind of a crazy move, man. Um, and she here could have played b3, just locking in the bishop. And it locks in the bishop because if you were to take, there's problems on the b-file. But she decides to play queen before, and th this is still, according to the... Listen, machine, not the best move. If you run these games through a computer, you could sit there like, That wasn't the best! Why'd you include this game? Um, but it allowed white back into the game. And the problem is that when you took these two pawns, now your pieces went from attacking powerhouses to desperately trying to cling on to the defense of the other pieces. Um, Rook e7, queen b3, she now plays queen a5, and all of a sudden we've got a fork of a2 and d8. I mean, that's bad. Bishop comes back to b6, queen comes back to e1. Like, what is going on here? Neither of these pieces can move. Kramnik takes another pawn for good measure. And now rook takes b7. Here, rook e2 just won a piece, by the way. Uh, rook b7, bishop f7. At this point, it's like the last person to make a blunder is going to lose this game, and it was Kramnik after rook b1. He plays bishop f2 going for danger levels, but after takes, 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 uh, the dust settles, and she's up a rook for a bishop. And to win an endgame like this, you double A. He pigs on the seventh rank again. You see that, right? Takes, takes, rook a7, and... Uh, Kramnik just resigned here because even though he can defend his pawn for a while on a4, this is completely winning for white. White will win this by advancing the pawns, not trading all of them, but ultimately coming in with the king. The rook also completely shuts off the king moving forward, and uh, Kramnik wins. Uh, Judith wins against Kramnik. Kramnik does not win this game. Um, so, again, the, the game of the video that was like, eh, but it's a win versus Kramnik, so it's a win versus Kramnik, so I'm including it. Now, for the 10th win, we're looking at a game against Veselin Topalov. He is a, uh, I believe how, I forgot how long he was world champion, uh, but incredibly strong player, super gifted tactically and creatively. They have a very similar style. Uh, and this is in Mexico City in 2010. I believe it's a rapid game. Uh, this tournament actually had, like, a ton of really strong players, but it's awesome because she played the King's Gambit. <laughs> like, what? I've, I've barely covered King's Gambit games ever on my channel. And Bishop C4, and this is one of the lines where White, where White gets hit with this check, can't block, and goes King F1. So she sacrifices the right to castle, gets checked early, and now just tries to build an initiative around the positioning of Black's pieces. Tabalov plays this, she takes the center with a second pawn. Castles and King F2! To try to bring the rook to E1, and ultimately castle by hand. Tabalov plays knight B6, the bishop moves out of the way, and he takes on D5, but this allows her to target the knight in the center with the move C4. Now, black either can back up and get overrun, or jump into the pit of fire with the move knight to E3. On the surface, it looks like you lose a pawn, however... This slows white down and gives black a very important move to finish development. Bishop f5 is not the best move. Uh, Topalov should have fought for the center with his pawn with c5 because that at least would have shut out white's bishop and tried to open things up in the center first. But by playing bishop f5, now she plays c5 and the bishop comes here, but it's actually not really where the bishop wants to stand, ironically. The bishop liked to be here. Here it can be a target. It's kind of in the way of stuff. It's not really easy to coordinate a queen with two bishops when the knight defends all the important squares. Topalov continues to try to fight with the bishops. The problem is that now the rook can come back. The rook which we thought went off to wander in the opponent's territory comes back. The bishop is a target, and we see the problem. That while you try to defend your bishops, rook comes down, and now this rook is just destroying everybody. It's like a, like a slingshot rook. Bishop f3, and here, danger levels. Queen is hit, queen is hit. If you take like this, I take this. If you take like this, then I play queen h3. But what if you take with the king? The queen is still under attack. The bishop is under attack. And if you play queen f6, I just go here. And she was up a piece. The dust settled in like five, six moves in this game. She brought her queen out. She played h4 to prevent g5. And, uh, well, she finished the game by bringing the one piece that hadn't gotten a turn. And Topalov resigned. Now, the, I believe that in Classical, they had a 10-9 record. It was super close. I mean, I could have picked a lot of games. 
but it was a king's gambit and the king took on f3 and the king never castled and was like an integral in the attack for white i mean it's just a very fun game so i wanted to include this one i could have included a lot and now it's time folks for her win against magnus carlson so we're actually at the same tournament in Mexico City, but two years later. It's 2012. Magnus Carlsen is already ranked number one in the world. Uh, I don't... This is before the Candidates tournament. So the Candidates happened in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. And it's right before he became a world champion. And Judith had famously said that playing Magnus Carlsen feels like you're drowning. And I would imagine. Um... I mean, he's Magnus Carlsen. So it's pretty funny that she chose the King's Indian defense. Now, the King's Indian is wild, aggressive. It's great nowadays for Rapid and Blitz. It's also good for Classical, but at the highest of levels, it's rarely seen because computers have shown critical ways to get advantages against it and maintain them. Now, in this game, we have Knight to A6, trying to put the Knight on C5 and target the center. Uh, Bishop E3 counteracts that plan. She plays Queen E8. Now, Queen E8 is a fascinating move. It looks like it literally makes no sense. And the point is that the queen is a ba is like a is like a beacon, like a lighthouse on e8. It can fight for the center, it can fight for the queen side. If f5 is ever played, it can fight for the king side. And well, let's see. G4, the knight comes to c5 after all to target the center. Knight drops back to d2 to, to defend the center, and now you play a5 to prevent the move b4. Black finishes development, and now we see c6. The idea potentially to be to play b5 in the future. Carlsen plays rook g1. No more castling on that side of the board. She plays king h8, h4, knight g8. Anticipating a kingside advancement, you back up, and maybe you will lash out yourself with the move f5. No king's Indian is complete without the move f5. Okay? Queen c2, bishop d7. We still do not have a single exchange. Castles, and now she takes. So the queen has teamed up with the bishop on this diagonal. Very difficult decision for Magnus to take with what? He chooses not to take with the, with the pawns, but take with the knight. She plays knight e6. He continues advancing on the side of the board with the move h5. Um, g5. To try to close everything down, bishop to uh, a4. b3, bishop c6. So she's kind of shut down Magnus's kingside advancement. Knight b6, rook d8. And now she actually utilizes the square on f4 for her knight. Now, taking here would just be devastating. Uh, that one trade would just lead you to being strategically lost as this bishop opens up and white is just simply dead. So bishop goes back to f1 and she completely shuts it down. So goodbye kingside attack for Magnus Carlsen. The pawn on a5 is now lost, but now here comes the wild move of the game, f5. Now, this move does not look possible because after gf5, you just take the pawn. But she takes on h5. Magnus, don't hang your rook. Okay, he didn't hang it. Knight comes forward to f6. Knight jumps back to d5. Rook to a8, utilizing the open file against Magnus. Queen b4, the rook comes to defend the d6 pawn. f3, oh, oh, hello. Now I see the rook again. Rook moves out of the way, and now the clutch trade. Bishop takes on d5. Now, it's actually funny. In the span of about three moves, we went from what the computer says is plus one to, in this position, minus four. This position is completely lost for white. What? How? By virtue of tactics, these queens will see each other. For example, if you play knight takes d5 and something takes back, I have this. Oops. Now, she did it this way. She took like this and then did it like this, which is still good. He takes on g5. Queen takes g5. The desperado sacrifice because you're going to lose your queen anyway, so you might as well sacrifice it. And when the dust settled, Judith Polgar's got an extra piece. King's Indian, baby. ED5, knight d5. She jumps in with the knight. Magnus goes for counterplay. She moves the bishop out of the way. Rook h2. Bishop c... Uh, sorry, rook c8. Bishop c4. Now, you're up material. Simplify. Just get the pieces off the board. Magnus can't beat you down a bishop. You know, he, he's not the boogeyman. Rook b2, rook c7. He's still creating a little bit of play here with his pawns. But she trades the c pawn off. She puts the king in front of the pawn so it cannot advance forward. And this move it ensures there will be more trades. So they trade rooks. And uh, it was on move 50 in this position when this knight is trapped on the edge of the board that Magnus Carlsen resigned. And that was Judith's 11th win in her career versus a number one player or a world champion. In this case, Magnus Carlsen, number one player. Gary Kasparov, number one player. Um... 
And now folks, as I promised you in the introduction, I will just tell you the inspiration for this video and we'll sign off. So my inspiration for making uh, a video quite like this one, uh, specifically of uh, a woman defeating 11 of world champions, because you can argue that, well, I could have made a video, I could have found like this kind of statistic from other players' careers, and maybe I will in the future. However, uh, Judith Bulgar is, uh, is a trailblazer uh, in many, many ways. So she sought out uh, to bridge the uh, the gender gap in chess without playing a, sim a single women's world championship ever. And she's a massive proponent of abolishing specific women titles. She thinks it, it, it sets the bar a lot lower for them. Uh, she's very open and outspoken about this, whereas the counter argument is that women's title in chess uh, encourages participation up to a certain point. She never liked that, and she constantly... Uh, tried to challenge all of the best players in the world, and as you can see from this video, defeated many of them. Um, now, I, with this video and kind of with this little small segment here, just wanted to say that th there is 100% uh, a gender gap in chess, uh, and historically there have been massive barriers for, for women participating in chess. Particularly, Susan Polgar, Judith's older sister, was not allowed to get a Grandmaster title by the Hungarian Chess Federation in her youth because she refused to play events only for girls. So, like, the rules have been in place from a bureaucratic standpoint. This isn't just, like, j just talk. I mean, I mean, they did not let her get the Grandmaster title despite her getting 11 norms. So, like, barriers have been in place for many, many years. Now nowadays, you say, well, there are no barriers. I mean, girls and boys can all learn chess in school. Yes, absolutely. However, before the Queen's Gambit, I had a 1.5% female viewing audience. Like, there is a massive divide. And so, people like Judith can be a massive role model for young girls in chess. She frequently, I mean, she puts on all sorts of uh, educational and scholastic events in Hungary, and she does the Global Chess Festival, um, and she frequently speaks to, like, you know, women in chess and U.S. women in chess, and uh, that's kind of why I wanted to highlight this, that in the future, especially now we have a much, uh, much greater uh, youth generation playing, a lot of young girls playing, uh, Judith Polgar 100% should be a role model, and she is an outlier historically, far and away an outlier, but people like her are possible if more young girls play the game and get as obsessed with chess as, as boys, and uh, uh, we, we, this is just something that I think that can happen over the next few decades, but that's why I made this video. So you can argue I could have made this video about other male grandmasters defeating world champions, but that was my logic, that was my justification, and uh, now I've got about 4.5%, 5% female viewing audience here on uh, on YouTube after the Queen's Gambit. So, uh, I'm very open, uh, and I, 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 I like to talk about this issue, and um, it, it, they're, they're, what, well, you can feel free to get involved in the comments below. Um, but uh, I have a positive outlook on all of this in the future. So... Hope you enjoyed the video. It's quite a long one, longer than my usual. And uh, let me know if there's anything you want me to cover in future content. I will see you in the next video. Peace out. Get out of here.